Welcome to the MSing About YouTube channel. Now, while I have MS, the emphasis is on messing about more than MS. I might share some anecdotes about my travels or brushes with fame I've had, or chat about those so-called good old days of the 50s and 60s when I was a kid. Who knows? They say there's a fine line between a collector and a hoarder, but I enjoy the memories that old photos and gadgets and stuff can provoke. Let's kick off with a memory from 1970. I would have been about oh, 15 or 16. Now, look at the young lad holding the debating trophy. Butter would not melt in his mouth, or so it would seem. You see, I invented a way to cheat at debating. I didn't think on my feet as quickly as the other two blokes, so I was first speaker, which meant I could prepare every word. And that preparation just might have included making up quotes to suit the argument. You know, something like, as Sir Winston Churchill famously stated, the youth of today are the leaders of tomorrow. Meaningless rubbish like that that somehow sounded substantial. But the reason for dragging this blast from the past out is to mention the school debating master, Richard Blackett. As well as debating, he taught Latin and English, and ancient and modern history, and he was a housemaster from 1964 to 2015. That's 51 years. So the topic for today's debate is, did Richard teach for 51 years or teach one year 51 times? Discuss. And here's another trophy I picked up back then. It was for coaching an undefeated football team, the under 14 Cs. Now, I'm not bragging about being a great coach, but I think it came down to a cliche I was years away from hearing that there's no I in team. I told them all on one day that this was their team. They were to play for the fun of playing and play for your mates, not to get promoted to the B or the A team because of any individual ambition. And it worked because of the mateship, but also because I fluked some damn fine players for a C-ranked team. One of them went on to play for Australia. So here's my debating subject. Is it okay for a school to present a beer tankard to a student who isn't old enough to legally drink beer? Discuss. Now, this is a Georgian toddy ladle. I know that because it has a coin in there that says 1812 and it has a twisted baleen handle. Baleen's another word for whalebone. I think a whale died for that. Mm. Different times. See, whaling was okay back then. Around that time, it kept the newly settled Australian colonial economy afloat. And what was a toddy ladle? Well, approaching the 18th century, punch was popular and drinks were served by elegant silver punch ladles. By the 19th century, punch had gone out of fashion, and a stronger beverage called a toddy was the go. Now, punch came back in fashion and toddies fell by the wayside. So today's debating topic, should an antique made from whalebone be destroyed because of our current opinions on conservation and the environment? Discuss. Oh, and if you'd like a hot toddy nightcap, you just need hot water, whiskey, honey, and lemon. If it's not sweet enough, Add more honey, if it needs more zing, more lemon. Meant to be great for a cold. And here's a photo worthy of discussion. The ladies in this house, my wife and daughter, think she's underage. I think she's definitely over 18. And when it comes to the good old days, this looks like one of the better ones. A naked flapper flashing for a flash photo in the 1920s. And because she's accessorised and smiling, I'm thinking it was totally consensual photography. Flappers were the first real feminists. They got over World War I, they got over the Spanish flu pandemic, and they got over their parents' Victorian morality. Like the men of the day, they drank alcohol, they smoked cigarettes, and they enjoyed a bit of hanky-panky at things called cuddle parties which I guess was the 1920s version of Tinder. Now, who knows if more than the photo developed here. It may have moved on to a couple of drinks, some horizontal leisure and a bit of post-rumpy, pumpy cigarette, who knows. And good on them, I say, because those good old days 
came crashing to a halt in 1929 when the Great Depression hit. In Australia, unemployment rose to 32% and it took a decade to crawl out of the economic black hole. And that year was 1939, just in time for another world war. Okay, debating question. Is this art or pornography? Hmm. Discuss. Moving on. This is a photo of me in 1978 on a visit to Athens. I've told you about some of the adventures I had with my best mate Pete when we went overseas together for six months. I tried to recall the best day and the worst day of that trip. And here are those two. Now, my favourite part of Athens is the Plaka. It's like a village that sits under the shadow of the Acropolis. Now, some afternoons I'd drop into a taverna for an ouzo or a coffee over a game of tavli with a local, Tavli's Greek for backgammon. And one afternoon, Pete and I pulled up an outside table. It had an excellent view of the Acropolis looking down on us, and it was postcard stereotypical with wicker chairs, bougainvillea, and visiting cats. A bunch of Americans at the next table struck up a conversation that led to the joining of tables. Lots of beer, lots of laughter, dinner, more drinks, and the spectacularly lit ruins above. The Greek restaurant owner had lived in Melbourne and he had inside walls adorned with AFL memorabilia and he showed the Americans how Australians have a sense of bonding. It was late in the evening and there was just our table left and he came out, he gave me the keys, said help ourselves to the fridge, lock up when finished and push the keys through the postal slot. Needless to say, we paid for more beers and left a nice tip on the bar. The low light of the trip, involved a combination of fear, panic and boredom on the last day of our travels. You see, one thing we did wasn't an adventure. It was snapping up a bargain. We each bought a hand-tailored suit in Bangkok for a fraction of the price of you'd pay for a suit off the rack in Sydney. And so chuffed were we that we decided to wear them for the last leg of our trip. So here we were, both in our 20s, Pete a few months into a scruffy beard and me with an afro, in cheap suits made in Thailand, lobbing at customs. Surely we were screaming out for a body search for drugs and well, yes, indeed, he stepped this way, gentlemen. To paint a picture, here's Pete and me in the Philippines heading up to Paxanan Falls. Now put those blokes in cheap suits, all nice, and here's Pete comfortably wearing the hat belonging to the constable who made our parking infringements in the UK disappear. That's another story. But we were mid-twenties and bulletproof. So we were separated at Sydney Airport and taken to the interrogation rooms. It took a couple of hours and I remember standing in my undies in a stark room watching a uniformed officer examining the suit and, and for a moment I did wonder if the tailor had sewn some substance inside the lining. Well, we left relieved, but for some reason we quickly fell out of love with those suits. Debating topic, is travel best with an itinerary or just let the world unfold through serendipity? Discuss. And speaking of a body search at Sydney Airport, now Doug Edwards and I were commissioned to write a radio series to help launch Warner Brothers Movie World on the Gold Coast. Called the Looney Tunes Radio Show, it consisted of 65 episodes of Mayhem, with the Oscar-winning Waskily Wabbit Bugs Bunny and the rest of the gang running amok in Australia. The series was an irreverent audio cartoon aimed at adults. For example, episode one was the flight from Hollywood to Australia with all the characters on board. The Tasmanian Devil was zipping about in the overhead lockers. Porky Pig was enjoying his first taste of airline food. Pepe Le Pew was chatting up the flight attendant. And of course, Tweety Torty Tora Putty Tat. Now, when they arrived at Sydney Airport, Bugs did a head count on the team bus and the little black duck was missing. He'd been taken to a stark room by customs officers for a random strip search for drugs. And on emerging, Bugs asked, did they find anything? And Daffy replied, Gibbleth. And the show had the desired result for Warner's advertising agency in Australia, and Doug and I saw an opportunity. We re-recorded tried and true sketches from other shows we produced using American voices, 
and made appointments with radio syndication houses in Chicago, New York, and with Warner Brothers in Hollywood. We arrived in Los Angeles. We were given a somewhat VIP welcome with a personalized guided tour of the Warner Brothers back lot before a scheduled meeting at the studio offices with one of the programming executives. Now, arriving at the Warner Brothers executive floor, high up in a shiny glass and chrome building, we were greeted by an effusive Afro-American receptionist who made us welcome with iced water and took us into the boardroom. The huge table with leather chairs and magnificent views over Los Angeles told us we were about to meet someone important. And the important young and suited executive arrived and he was also effusive. He loved the Looney Tunes radio concept and he'd be pitching it at a programming meeting for us the following Tuesday. Perfect timing for us because we had those other appointments. After unsuccessful pitching in Chicago and New York, we returned to Los Angeles for the Warner Brothers board's decision. At the designated meeting time, we rode up the lift to the executive floor, only to be greeted by a very non-effusive Afro-American secretary with no iced water. She rose from her desk, turned us around and accompanied us back to the ground floor. It was best we leave, she said, because the executive who put the radio concept forward had been fired for even thinking that a radio series would enhance the Looney Tunes brand. And I put the lack of enthusiasm from Warner Brothers down to one word, gibberth. Debating topic, can failure sometimes be more fun than success? Discuss. If you enjoyed this MSing About segment, please like, share, subscribe. Check out our Facebook page and website, msingabout.com.au. Thanks for watching, uh, and we'll catch you next time. That's all, folks.